Well, thank you everybody. I'm assuming everybody uh, enjoyed the film. You know, we're just gonna have a little conversation up here and then we've got a, a hefty line already, so we'll just start to... Uh, how early did you have to get hop into line there to be the first person in line? I was here about 10 minutes ago. Okay. Not, not really that long. So not too bad. You didn't start like two minutes into the film, you just stood there the rest of the... <laughs> right, yeah, I showed up about 10 minutes before the film. I, I, standing here for the next three hours. All right. <laughs> um, well, I guess one of the first things I wanted to, uh, is your microphone working? Is it? Oh. Okay, good. James uh, is working. She's I wanted, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask the two of you was, uh, you know, what does it feel like to be literally legitimate rock stars now, apparently, because... Uh, <laughs> Yes, next question. So, one of the uh, one of the things that we talked about a little bit the other day, and I, I think a lot of people aren't maybe really familiar with, is obviously the name of your podcast, Instagram, and everything else is Team Deacons. Like, you guys are a team, and it takes, you know, a team to, to do everything that you do and put everything together, and can you just talk a little bit about what this what this great team is like that you've, uh, that you, you've had for so many years here and how you work so closely together to really achieve everything as a as a power couple. Oh, we just do everything together, don't we? Like we're together, we do everything together. I can see why it wouldn't work for some people, but we're okay being together 24-7. When we <laughs> do a movie, we just we talk about it from the beginning to the very end. We're incredibly boring. We only talk about the film when James, we're working on it. James is a sort of much more of a people person than I am. So <laughs> we're kind of good together. Roger would prefer not to be on stage at all and just uh, just enjoy the work that you've been on stage. I was on stage shooting uh, Chuck Berry once, you know, like that. that sort of thing is fine, but not like this. Wait, Roger, you shot Chuck Berry once? I did Chuck Berry, Begging Berry, Muddy Waters, and B.B. King on the same day. Did you ever shoot the Beatles? Did you ever shoot the Beatles? Uh, I didn't really like the Beatles. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I was into Woody Guthrie when everybody was into the Beatles, I think. Well, and, and but that part of that is because you got your start in music videos, documentaries, still photography before, you know, coming fully into, uh, you know, filming again. Yeah, I mean, I think mainly I was doing documentaries before I started doing featured feature films full time. Most most of the work I was doing was documentaries. Yeah. Well, we have a long line there, so nobody wants to hear me ask questions. But I'm just we're just going to jump straight to the line, I guess, and we'll go from there. So why don't you just uh, tell us your name and ask your question? Hey Roger, my name is Luke. You met me earlier today. Uh, you signed a book. <clears throat> you told me to present my photo in black and white. Uh, I showed you a couple of photos of mine. But the biggest question that I had was, you pay so much close attention to the way that architecture shapes the environment in this film. What inspires that? What, what makes you think about the way that the architecture inspires the narrative and um, inspires the story of the characters within specifically this film, Blade Runner 2049, or if there's any other film that the architecture shapes that. Well, I think it's like different uh, pre-production period we had on this film as opposed to many others. Since I spent a lot of time with Denny we, we spent a lot of time in Montreal when he was coming arrival, but we, we were there doing storyboards. So, you know, we would work in the mornings and he would come in the afternoons and start talking through the, what we'd done in the morning. Um, that was part of the process. But then, then at one point, um, I, went to, um, I went to London and, and um, Slovenia and to Hungary. Um, scouting with him, and a lot of it was about scouting the kind of buildings, the kind of architecture. Because everything in the film, in one way or the other, is, is sort of based on something real, like you know the red 
Red Las, Las Vegas could have been based on New York last week, but yeah, it was actually yeah, yeah. based on the, the Vuv in, in you know Northern Africa or something like that. And, and, and you know everything is sort of in some way based on reality. So we we scout a lot of scouted a lot of sort of brutalist architecture, especially in London. Um, and and where's and, London? Uh, there's, there's quite a bit in London, brutalist arc. I mean, a national theatre on the South Bank is brutalist kind of in style. And, um, you know, so then, you know, they, this, this was something actually before even Dennis Gassner came on board, you know, we were talking about the look of the film and the kind of architecture. And also we were sort of creating a world. So in this world, what would be the architecture? What would be, would they have newspapers? Would they have this? So we spent months talking about what this world would be. It's not like shooting a period film from the 50s where you kind of know what everything is. We were getting to create it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, they say, the sort of look of Las Vegas and everything really sort of started during those early discussions. And I mean, and that, that final look of Las Vegas, for instance, wasn't finalized until the whole FX team came on, you know, so it was quite a, a long journey, as they say, to find that, that actual look. We have a long line here, so we're going to move on to the next, yeah. next question. Thank you, Luke, appreciate that. And, and you know, maybe a little bit related to that, um, you know, as far as that look, you know, we've talked these, uh, this week quite a bit about how you like practical effects, practical sets, and obviously there's a lot of special effects still in that particular film, but how you don't want to work on green screen or LED volumes. Can you talk a little bit about shooting on this particular film, on how you achieved a lot of the looks you did without, you know, the massive use of green screen or, or LED volumes? I don't think we used a single green screen. I mean, obviously the shots, obviously the shots in the film that are total CG, or maybe everything CG except for the, the, the spinner was a kind of element that we shot an element of. But you know, the sea wall and all that, when you see it wide, is, is, um, is a CG. But all the stuff during the storm, when the spinner crashes in the ocean and, and on the, on the sea wall, that was all that something that was actually constructed. We actually built a tank in Budapest on a back lot to shoot the whole scene. The tank was about 160 foot square, I think, something like that. And um, yeah, I mean, so. There was actually remarkably little CG. That for something like that, you would. So many people have said to us, "Oh, all that CG," but we were doing. We were building the foreground and the background, um, and yeah. just doing stuff in the background. And even when you know the scene with the pink joy, you know the big advert where she comes out of a two D into a three D. We we did have a big screen there. We had that footage being played back, so all the lighting was interactive. Um, but I mean, when she becomes a 3D image and comes out, obviously then that's a CG um, extension of what was actually on the screen in the first place. Um, so yeah, I mean, most, most of, in fact, I think all of the scenes actually had, a, had mostly foreground and mid-ground in camera. Even when he's on the rooftop early on in the rain, I mean, even uh, there's, there's some panning lights and there's a, like a big screen with a woman, sort of like an advert in the background. That's all done in camera. All, all that was changed was a few spinners fly through and some very, very far background uh, lights were added, a few shadows of buildings. Um, you know, I mean, it, the reason to do it is not only just because it's it's cheaper, easier, Denny, I, everybody else can see what we're actually shooting, but it's actually more fun, you know? Great. Go ahead and introduce yourself and ask your question. Oh, hello, uh, John. My name is Max. So I was wondering, um, what emotions and qualities does this picture evoke for you? Um, <laughs> Loneliness. Uh, particularly your, uh, your work in the picture. Well, I hope my work kind of is in tune with 
the feeling of what the character is going through, on the feeling that the character is struggling with his own sense of reality. I mean, I hope what I was doing was enhancing that part of the story and the, the emotional reaction you have to the story and the characters and the, the shots, you know what I mean? You're just trying to make it all of a piece. Um, my emotional reaction to the film, I, you know, I, I think Denny is a really great director. I think this film, and I think Sicario, and I think the film that I didn't work on, Han Sandi, are three pretty remarkable films because they quite simply are about something. Uh, thank you. All right, next question. Yeah, Roger, my name is uh, Tank, and uh, I guess I kind of like the four films we've shown, uh, you know, No Country, and Just James on Film, and Sicario, and sort of shot on digital. Um, and I, I know Paul, you talked about the shooting on film versus digital. Uh, but I guess whether you're shooting on film or on digital, or like this movie, uh, how important is authenticity to you? And like trying to, uh, whether it's something that has CG in it, or like a shot of the character's face and making, I guess, the audience feel presence and make that world feel realistic. I think that's what you're trying to do all the time, isn't it? I don't care if it's film or digital, you know, motion or digital. I think that's a kind of completely non-argument, really. Um, it's, it's what you point the camera at, the framing and how you light it. And also I think that we try and shoot things the way we want it to ultimately look like, not to fix it later in post, but to get it on the day. There, those are all the filmmakers in the room applauding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't, I mean, even Blade Runner, I think, apart from there were a lot of fact shots coming in, so we had to stay doing the final DI for about three weeks, I think, but basically we did the timing of five days, probably. I mean, you know, that's usually what we spend on a film is like five days, because we basically shot it the way we want it. You know, I think Sicario, we did it in three days. You know, yeah, but then we sat around and waited for the way for the other so. visual effects, so you end up spending a couple of weeks, but yeah, I mean, you're trying to immerse the audience in the story, you know. Um, I don't know what else to say, really. Yeah, you're trying. You're not. You're not trying to create flash images for the sake of flashy images. You know, I'm. I'm, I'm not using. I. I don't. I mean, the only film that I've used kind of. I will have used kind of specialist lenses now and again. But um, Jesse James is the only example that stands out as being. A specialist lens. Otherwise, I don't want to be aware of the lens. I want the image to be as sharp and clean as I see with my eyes. And um, yeah, I, I, you're trying to immerse the audience in the story. So what I'm trying to do is just that. It's trying to be as 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 um, you know immersed, as immersive as possible. I don't really want an audience to notice what I'm doing. You know, it's kind of nice when they do, but not in the way that means, you know? You know what I'm saying? You want the audience just to be in the story. Great, thank you very much. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Leopold. Um, Mr. Deegan's, uh, as your career is going on, uh, you started to work with directors whose resumes are much shorter than your own. How have your working relationships changed over your career and, and uh, as that sort of dynamic has, has grown and sort of the legend of Roger Deakins has become this thing that, that it is. I think the only thing that's really changed is you're a little more confident. A little more. <laughs> <laughs> and basically what you're always looking for is collaboration with the director. So no matter if, if the director's never done a film before, but you're going to work with them as a director, you still are obligated to create their vision. So you're still working with the director. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the first, we were the first film I kind of admit to, though I did a couple of others, but the first feature film that I admit to was with the director Mike Bradford in 1984, but this was the one we did together before that. 
And it was the same way as I worked with Denny, obviously not as extensive prep as on this film, but on Sicario it was the same way. You spend a few weeks talking through the script, just, yeah, talking about whether do you need that dialogue even. You're talking through the scenes and talking how you want to visualize it. Now. And um, then you spend time scouting locations and then you try and match it up and figure what way you're going to have to compromise or where you're not going to compromise uh, because of the budgets and time and everything else. So I don't, I don't think the way I've worked now or worked with Sam, say, on the last film or with, say, Mike Radford all that time ago in 1983, I don't think it was very different. Uh, maybe that's because... <laughs> I'm not somebody that changes very much, but um, no, I think it, it, I, that's the way I enjoy working. It's kind of you have this sort of personal relationship that just evolves over the pre production period and into shooting. And, and with luck, by the time you come to shooting, there's very little discussion that has to happen other than, you know, some spontaneous reaction to something that happens on the set where the actor or, or whatever can happen, can change change what you do from your plan, you know? Thank you both for being here. Thank you. And when you say Sam, you mean Sam Mendes, of course, for anyone who may not know. I'm, I'm assuming, but you never know, some people in the audience may not know what Sam Mendes we're talking about. Which Empire of Light? Um, if anyone in the audience hasn't seen that yet, of course, recently. So, so, so check that one out. Hi, guys. My name is Frank, and um, the setup to my question is, I, I just want to tell you that yeah, that ending scene always destroys me. I think it's one of the most beautiful and poetic scenes in modern cinema because outside, you've got the synthetic boy dying in the real snow. And the Vangelis score comes up. And then inside, the real girl is in the synthetic snow. And it's just, when Decker puts his hand up, cut the black, it's just an emotional gut punch. And you just made it look so easy. So. That said, what was your most challenging scene in the film? It wasn't Van Jennings, by the way, was it? It's uh, Benjamin Walfish. What was that? It, it, it samples the Van Jennings score. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. It's but it's Benjamin yeah. Walfish. Yeah. 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 What was the most challenging? Yes. I think um, possibly the water tank was pretty challenging. Yeah, the water tank, I suppose, just because of production um, way, it was going to be challenging because we were going to go to Malta where there's a standing tank and they've got all the equipment but then the budget didn't go that far and it proved cheaper to be able to do to build an actual facility in in budapest and it was also very very cold and they were worried about killing harrison <laughs> <laughs> so, so they kept making the water warmer and warmer so they kept getting more and more foggy you know, the funny thing was they, i didn't know they kept making the warmer water warmer it ended up going 75 degrees, but the air temperature was all virtually freezing because the pubs were freezing where we put the camera tracks and stuff. And of course, that was giving all this amazing atmosphere because most of the time it was too thick, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. But when it sort of blew through, when we put some wind machines up, it worked really well. But I never told production I was glad of it because it, I, they never asked me about it. <laughs> so it was one of those lucky accidents that I will never tell anybody about, but now I suppose Except it's Except for you guys, so don't tell anybody. <laughs> trade secrets, trade secrets. Thank you both. Hi guys, I'm Bryce. Um, amazing Thank you for film. Um, I was just wondering in your experience how directors uh, most effectively communicated the tone of each film to you and how they made it to where everybody was like kind of on the same page as far as the crew because I feel like it's super that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm kind of nervous to uh, get on a set and try to communicate that to everybody. Yeah, I mean, it, that's the, one of the hardest things, I think, but it's, it's also hard, you know, if you, but you break it down, the director is trying to um, get his keys on board, like, you know, the production designer, the costume supervisor, whatever, and the cinematographer, and the editor, and, and the music, uh, you know, and, and, but then those people, like, then I have to do that job with the people that are on my team, you know, and, and then 
my gaffer or whatever has to impart that to the electricians or the, the, the dimmer board operator or whatever, you know. So it's, it's uh, yeah, and that's one of the crucial things. And I think that's why prep is so important. I think that's why it's so important to have time before the whole intense pre-production process starts. Just have that time to sit down you know, I mean, with some directors, it's going to the pub and having a beer and just chatting about it or something, you know, just to get in sync. But uh, also, every director works in a different way, as I've, I've, I've found. Some directors, you know, like Andrew Dominic for Jesse James, was really keen that, on getting images. So we had, like, a corridor in the production office full of images, but you could walk the corridor and you would be basically walking scene one to the end of the movie in, in images that we just all pasted up in, in some sort of order that reflected what his intent for the film. And other directors not visual at all. And sometimes, you know, you bring reference images or a certain photographer's work to the table so you have something visual to discuss. But, um, so, I mean, everybody works differently, but it, it's a matter, a matter of yes, finding that way of getting the team on board, really. And, and I think it's important as a director to know that it is your vision, that everybody's there for. So to have that confidence and then be able to take on board what other people think. So if you ask someone, well, what do you think? First of all, it involves them so much more. Second of all, they may have a really good idea that you haven't thought of. But third of all, you don't have to. Um, but you've made them feel part of it, and you possibly could have gotten a really great idea from it. So I, to me, the strongest directors are the people that are using the keys that they have chosen because they know what they're doing. So they're using them as tools and getting ideas from them. Yeah, we've been lucky. I mean, I'm, you know, hear tales. And I've experienced a little bit where, where the director thinks you're trying to take the project away from them. You know, they feel threatened. And I, I suppose in a way that, that yeah, yeah, that's simple as that. And, and it's not true. I mean, it shouldn't be true. Certainly, it's not true. There's to be, you're there to fulfill the director's wish, not anybody else's. You know, there's a million ways to shoot a film, but there's only one that the director wants. You know. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And it's also why you end up working with a lot of the same people because once you work with people that you like and that you know you work well with, yes. you don't want to change it up. You want that consistency. So much is about trust. You know, yeah. isn't it? My name is Kate, and my question is, which was the most, or what was the new challenge you faced on Blade Runner that you hadn't faced before, and what was your favorite scene in the film? Um, I mean, the, the, I suppose, I was going to say scale, but I was thinking that in a way Skyfall was bigger in scale than Blade Runner. Um, uh, well, I think the scene where joy melts into um, um, the two girls melt. Yeah, when they melt. <laughs> just the other characters. Lady, the Lady of the Night. So. Yeah, the Lady of the Night, yeah. Um, Mackenzie, that's, that's her real name. But, um, just figuring out how to shoot that was, I mean, it was really daunting. Well, yeah, the, the, effect, the effects, also the effects supervisor and everybody, they wanted to shoot, they wanted to shoot a scene with one girl and then just do a green screen shoot of the other girl and then they would paste them together. And, and, and I said, there is not no way that's going to work. For me, that's not going to work. And I said, well, where do you want it? I said, I want to do both girls on set. We'll do what, the one girl first, whichever Denny thinks is the strongest character in the scene, take her out and then do the other girl in, in the same space. Um, I mean, they pooed it, basically. I mean, to be quite honest, they said, that's not going to work. <laughs> we shot a test. And they said, yeah, okay, we can manage that. Yeah. <laughs> and the whole thing was, you know, you put somebody... I said to them, you know, you, you, you know, 
paved room was lit by those wall lights that we spent a damn lot of time designing and mounting and putting the light in and having dim assist and all the rest of what you do. And I said, well, how are you going to replicate that against the blue screen or green screen where you don't even put a light behind the girl when it's, you know, you shoot towards the girl? I mean, how's that going to work? So, I mean, they were great, actually. When we shot this test, they, they tried to do it and they said, yeah, that, that we can make it work. Yeah, and I, I don't think that you were really involved in this, but on a lot of these um, scenes that we did, they wanted witness cameras, which is just other cameras around, so they would have additional references. And I was adamant that it could not be an Alexa, it had to be a more inferior camera, because I just I was paranoid about it showing up yeah, in the movie. But on that one, they. They were so nervous about that film, about that scene, and I felt badly for them, so I let them use an Alexa. I said, this better never show up in the film no, 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 that for the witness the cameras. Cat, yeah. yeah, but they did an amazing job. I really didn't think it was going to work as well as it did. I'm just blown away that they argued with Roger Deakins about what was the best on camera. <laughs> oh no, the effects supervisor has done far more larger effects driven films than I ever have. You know, I mean, so it, it, the, they had a lot of experience. I was just, it was very nice that Denny backed me up and said, let's do a test and let's decide, you know. That's a sign of a good collaborative director. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Hi, my name is Zachary. I was actually going to ask you guys about that very scene. But you, can, you can adjust that microphone for everybody that's going to tilt it down a little. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. I was actually going to ask about that same scene, but thankfully I have a backup question. <laughs> <laughs> the 1982 Ridley Scott Blade Runner, probably 80-90% of the people in this room are here because of that movie, seeing it at a young age. That's obviously shot by Jordan from the West. It's one of the most iconic cinematography displays in movies. When I watch this one, beautiful as it is, I don't really see that it feels the same way through the light. It looks a little bit less like a film noir and a little bit more like a contemporary sci-fi film. So I was curious if you had that in mind from the beginning or if it was a conscientious decision to avoid looking like the previous film or if there were any other pieces of inspiration you guys used. We did it to look like the original. No, I mean, when Denny posted the, the idea that he was going to do this film, uh, it, it was actually the same conversation I had with Sam Mendes when he said he was going to do a Bond movie. I said, you know, I, I don't really want to do it if it's got anything to do with the other film. No, because I, I mean, in this case, I'm not Jordan Groverworth. I love his lighting. I mean, I have issues with the original film, but I'm one of my favorite, but one of my favorite film, my favorite scenes of any movie is Rutger Hauer's death scene on the rooftop, and it's got nothing to do with the lighting, it's to do with the emotion that comes from that scene, and that, that, that character, which I really took into this film, because in a, in a way it's dealing with the same idea, you know, what, what is, what constitutes being human. Um, yeah, so I mean, the way it's lit, it's, it's a very different film. I mean, for a start, the, the whole concept of it being real world rather than film noir, I mean, it's much more naturalistic than the original film. Um, the kind of the landscape and everything yeah, maybe it's a little bit more like other contemporary science fiction films, of which there aren't many. There's a lot of science, fa science fantasy, but there's very few science fiction films. Uh, um, I, I think it, it's just trying to do something different. Uh, so I, I don't, yeah, it doesn't look like original. It doesn't look like a film noir. It either stands or fall, falls by itself, you know. When we saw Jesse James, you cited I think it was Sam Peck and Pop in what they were doing there. Did you have anyone in mind when you were designing this during that prep time that you had so much of? That was such an important part of your process here. It's hard, hard to hear your question. Oh, excuse sorry. me, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, during the Jesse James screen, you had mentioned yeah. Sam Peck and Paw as the inspiration. I just didn't know if there was anybody here, or was it well, everybody? I don't think, when I said about, yeah, uh, Jesse James, Sam Peck and Paw, Sam, what Sam Peck and Paw was dealing with in terms of the stories 
uh, the emotions he's kind of dealing with, you know, the idea of, I said, I said, I said of the world changing and his people being left behind. Um, well, that's what I was saying, Blade Runner. I mean, I, refer, I would reference Tarkovsky's Solaris, but I mean, it's not Tarkovsky's Solaris, I would love that film if it was, if it was like a hundredth as good as Solaris, then that's, I think it's pretty good. Um, but I would mention that scene from the original Blade Runner, you know. I mean, it's those kind of, you know, or, I don't know, there's all sorts of things. There's cameras in the, the outside. I mean, it's all sorts of things that you kind of connect with that not necessarily, you're not copying the lighting because one's a book. But you know what I mean? You're trying to connect what you do with that in some way. Thank you very much. Maybe move on to the next person. Thank you. And uh, there are two Solaris out there for everyone that's going to rush out and watch Solaris. Make sure you watch the right one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, Roger. My name is Casper. Uh, first off, just wanted to say that I, I love this film. It's one of the most visually stunning pieces of art I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the director of this film, the evil knows, said that when he was first approached with directing a sequel to Blade Runner, that he was initially filled with fear. He believed that if the sequel didn't do the original Blade Runner justice, that he would be blacklisted from the cinematic community, his career would be over, and that it would be his last film. His words, not mine. Um, however, he also said that when he accepted all that as a possibility, and then still decided to continue, that it gave him the peace and freedom to create a pure artistic act. Uh, Roger, you said in a roundtable to The Hollywood Reporter that this was an opportunity you couldn't say no to, but I was wondering if you went through the same process that Denis did. Uh, was there any point in the making of this movie, either early on in the months where you spent storyboarding all the way up to post-production, where you really had to contemplate the consequences of possibly doing, uh, possibly falling short, but then decided to continue? And if so, was there a certain peace or freedom that you felt because of it? That's a lot of research that went into that question. That's what, this guy spent all week getting ready for this question. How they reporter? We're, we're good to go. No, here. no, the week, uh, no, the past month actually. Okay, good. <laughs> well, first James just said to me, you know, remember he's not a sequel. In no way was it ever. That was as the a first sequel. thing we all said. Um, not a sequel. Yeah, you have a responsibility, but. Um, yeah, and all the way through. But then, it's, that's no different on any film. It doesn't matter if somebody, some, you, you, somebody you might be relating your film or the work, film you're working on with something that's come before. That's going to be all the way through. Any film you do is going to be related to something else in some way. A film's got to stand on its own, in its own place. So yeah, there's always that pressure. There was the pressure of, would the sets be ready in time? Would it really work going from this set to that set? Could we get the atmosphere in? in, in, in we were shooting downtown in Budapest on a night shoot. Could we get the atmosphere? And would they allow us to block that street? And blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's a million, million problems that come up on a film like this. Uh, and yes, all the time you have doubts. And I still have doubts. No, I mean, you, you never get where you really want to go with anything, otherwise you would stop doing it. Everything is built on something that's come before. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, we're, we're moving through here. We only have 75 more people to go. Hello. James is pointing out I'm the first person shirt. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, my name is Clinton. Uh, so between all the films that you've done, my favorites are This, Prisoners, and Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Between each one of these films, I feel they have a drastically different color palette, with this one being a lot of neon colors, be it with um, uh, when we see Joy in like the big pink hologram, or like all the Vegas sequence in this like, bright orange and reds. Uh, prisoners being more of dark muted tones, and then Oh Brother, Where Art Thou being a lot of warm, earthy tones. What is it that makes you decide the color palette of a film before you start shooting? I think it seems to me that it's quite obvious, but <laughs> I mean, but I don't know. You kind of read a script, when you talk with the director. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of the colors in this, for instance, the red of Las Vegas, I was 
I mean, Denny, Denny said, and then I, I got these references of, uh, from, you know, the Baboo of North Africa and said, well, can we do this with a sort of tonal variation of it or whatever? Is this a good reference? Um, uh, other things, you know, the inside of like Wallace's building there, you know, the, the big corporate building, I mean, I guess I had the idea that if you're coming in from the outside, which is grey and rain and snow and, you know, really dark, wouldn't somebody maybe want to come into sunlight? So I thought, well, let's make everything inside as though it was sunlight. Well, it was also, too, he was such a rich guy that yeah, he could have sunlight. He could sunlight do anything he wants, else. you know. Yeah. And I thought, well, that was kind of ironic. He's blind. Anyway. <laughs> And, you know, certain things come like that. I mean, and yeah, somehow I mean, prisoners didn't seem very neon colored. <laughs> no, I mean, again, you know, the, the, yeah, prisoners was again one. I mean, again, that came from Denny. We we decided talking about it. We did not shoot. We didn't want to shoot in sunlight at all. But we had to for one or two days. But basically, everything's grey and gloomy and sombre. And um, Oh Brother was really interesting because they, 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 Joel and Ethan got the money for the film uh, to, so that we would shoot in what, August, I think, somewhere anyway, in summer sometime. And, and they, want, uh, they wanted it dry and dusty, but they needed to shoot in, <laughs> in Mississippi <laughs> because of the tax breaks. There we go. <laughs> and, uh, okay. So Joel and Ethan said to me, but yeah, but we want to look dry and dusty and maybe autumnal and like a like a painted po like a painted hand tinted postcard. <laughs> well that's great, we're going to Mississippi for summer. Which is very, very green. So, you know, we just sort of like found a way to do it. And Joel said, Well I'll aren't some people using this new digital finish? <laughs> so we started playing with that, you know. After spending like five weeks trying to do it photochemically, <laughs> doing it digitally, and, and, and you know, so the final look comes from many different places, really. But I laugh when you ask the question because to, to me it seems obvious that it should look like the way it looks. I don't know. <laughs> thank you very much. Great, thank you. And you know, um, you know, we've been talking some about AI this past weekend, and AI in the industry is like a big, everybody's worried about AI and stuff. Well, this film was really interesting because obviously, you know, this could be some potential futuristic version of what we get in in AI in the future. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of what we spoke about at SMU? You know, what could the impact of AI be on cinematography, and you know, what what we're actually shooting moving forward? I was just thinking, relative to the last question, what would AI do? <laughs> Somebody had a t-shirt the other I'm day. I'm reading his mind. What, what would Deacons do? Well, I would have a t-shirt. What would AI do? So would, what would Christmas look like? It would have tropical blue sky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother would be in black and white, probably. <laughs> God knows what this would be. I mean, but on the other hand, like everybody, you know, Jordan Cronenworth shot original Blade Runner with Ridley, and it looks very different than this. Everybody's got a different way of seeing, and that's what I worry about AI, because maybe every, I don't know, there'll be, everybody's AI will be the same, maybe, I don't know. Go ahead, what's your question? Yeah, uh, my name's Nori Niven. Um, I'm a huge fan, you've been such an incredible inspiration for uh, for everyone. James, you're amazing. You are incredible. Unfortunately, there's going to be a continued generation after generation of, of cinematographers who will be single because they're going to be looking around like, I need a production partner. This, this isn't working. <laughs> amazing. And thank you for the Dallas Film Commission for uh, bringing them here for your time. Um, I had a really quick question um, about you know, I love the fact that we're in the, the Jared Leto space with Harrison Ford, and, um, and Jared sits down, and there's a move that's very, very British, which is carrying him into the chair. Americans don't do that. I love the fact that the behind-the-scenes photo of you 
in the room and you've got the boom arm with a traditional hand, uh, hand carry, you're carrying the weight of the camera yourself and the technical lighting is so amazing and just, I just love the fact that you're, you're so tactile. Um, you don't mind throwing a camera on your shoulder and running with it. That's incredible. Um, I saw the screening in IMAX of this film originally, and it looked like it was time for the IMAX theater. I was enveloped in orange light from the Las Vegas set, and when you went into the theater, my eyes hadn't dilated yet, so I couldn't see Ryan Gosling in the foreground. I could only see Harrison Ford in the background, and I counted to three, and my eyes dilated, and I saw Gosling appear in the foreground. I came out like a, a come to Jesus moment. I was calling everyone, like, you will not believe what Roger just did. This is incredible. Was that on purpose? Jesus. <laughs> Definitely not. Sorry, we won't go there. Thank you. As far as up in the camera, right? It's because I come from documentaries. I always operate, and I, I just love being by the camera. And I find it's really nice looking through the eyepiece because nobody bothers you. They bother my wife. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know this was going to be a religious uh, revival. It's great. I love it. No. <laughs> Uh, hi James, hi Roger. Uh, my name is Roger too, but with the D. Uh, I have a question for, for both of you guys. Uh, what is the most interesting movie uh, that you've seen this year, and why did it resonate with you? Uh, Roger with a D has Roger with a with, with without a D stumped for a moment. Okay, find that really hard. <laughs> um, um, I watched The Wild Bunch again a few weeks ago. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I also watched Stalker, actually. Yes. Well, recently? Um, well, you know, we do this podcast and it's really interesting because we're actually watching, we're actually watching, you know, films by directors or films that the people that we're going to talk to have worked on, and we've seen quite a lot that we... Of their first films. Uh, that we, 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 we never knew existed, or whatever, yeah. and, I, I, and that's actually... So, I'm sorry, but contemporary films, we haven't seen so many lately, but quite old ones, we've seen quite a lot. Well, last year, we, let's see, we saw Good Night, Alfie, right? And oh, we liked that. Good, yeah. That was very clever. Um, Oh, Territory. The, Bat the Batman was really well done. I was inadvertently quoted in a <laughs> Hollywood <laughs> rag that I thought. Yeah, anyway, but I do, I, do think, I, I do think Batman was stupendously sharp. I know it was great, it's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you guys. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. My name is Mickey. Just wanted to say one thing real quick. Uh, so, Roger with a D. He's my best friend. He's a filmmaker. I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in the future you guys work together. My Twitter <laughs> name is Hollywood Drift. Just going to plug him real quick. But anyways, just to say, okay, so I wanted to give you a real quick thing. So, we're best friends. All of our best moments in life together have been going to movies. I want to say you've been responsible with so many moments for both of you where we've just been blown away. Like the, the seawall scene in this movie, in Skyfall when there's that, when they're fighting in the penthouse up in the building, in 1917 when the, like, the lights are going off in the courtyard, like so many moments where we've just been in awe. And I just want to say thank you for that and for giving those moments to me and Roger. Uh, but additionally, do you have a movie where you like, there are there, are, is the equivalent of that to you? Do you have any moments where you're like, holy shit, like this is crazy, like I don't see it. Crazy shit. And also, would you ever do a Star Wars movie? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I just said about Batman, I think it was stunningly photographed. Um, but like a scene, like a moment where you're just like, oh, whoa. I think if cinematography works, I think you're, 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 you're telling me that 
my work has failed because yeah, right. Whoa. Um, I, I think it's cinematography works, you don't have those come to <laughs> Jesus <laughs> moments. Roger, Roger, take a compliment. <laughs> No, um, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, I'm impressed with. Uh, the, I mean, there's a, there's a large number of cinematographers now that do really fantastic work. And yeah, I mean, you could be watching. I mean, we won't like watching <laughs> Scandinavian noir detective series, and some of them, sometimes they go, How the hell did they get that? That's really beautifully shot. You know what I mean? They could be anywhere, you know. True. Okay. And also, Connie Hall has always been a huge inspiration. Yeah. And we I'm recently cool, in. saw In Cold Blood, oh, which is yeah. an amazing film. True. Yeah, okay. yeah, In Cold Blood, I think, yeah. But I mean, also, we did Fat City, which also blew me away. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of films when I was, before I was even thinking I could be in cinema in any way. There's a lot of films that blew me away. Um, Peter Walking Walking, which was shot 16 mil, kind of black and white, grainy. And that's wobbly, like you're in you, you like, you're like, oh, yeah. I, it, I just thought, it, it was just so powerful. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, but it's the combination of the image, the cinematography with the story right, and what right, the director's right. trying to get across. Yeah. And when that works seemingly together, you don't really notice it, you know what I mean? You're just drawn into the thing as a whole. For sure, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope everybody's taking notes on their watch list later. Wild Bunch, Scandinavian Noir. Where do you find Scandinavian Noir? Like, if you want to, if I want on Netflix, Netflix. Yeah. you can find it on Netflix. Yeah. All right. Look up Nordic Noir. Nordic Noir on Netflix. The three ends. <laughs> cool. Howdy, y'all. My name's Aaron Garcia. Um, wow. Oh, I guess. Yeah, that's a fair <laughs> well, um, so my question is re with regards to people like blocking and staging of scenes. Um, as a cinematographer, how significant of a collaboration is there between you and the director to uh, accomplish these matters? And is this something that varies scene from scene, film to film? Uh, thank you. Yeah, it definitely varies, kind of from scene, scene to scene, film to film, director to director. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes there's a lot of talk before and prep about how it, you know, or storyboarded and how it could be, but. Um, Always, when there's a rehearsal, there's a discussion afterwards with um, the director. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I even, even like with the Coen brothers, everything's storyboarded in pre-production. But there's always a blocking rehearsal with the actors on the set on the day, on the morning of the shoot. And yeah, you know, I'm always there. Yeah, and, you know, maybe suggest things and things done differently or whatever. It's that sort of exchange. Um, and I think it's been like it's been like that every director I've worked with. Well, I mean, the only time that didn't happen was in 1917. Well, because we did that all in prep. Because the <laughs> yeah, shot right. had to be the shot. I mean, it had to yeah. be worked out in advance of the day of the shoot. The day of the shoot was then just a technical challenge for the actors and the you know the team to to capture what had already been mapped out. And the thing is, when you're blocking on the set, oftentimes the director is looking at the performances and all of that, and the, the cinematographer is standing there and thinking about the shots. So the director does turn to the cinematographer afterwards and say, well, what do you think? The shot was often. Thank you. Hello. My name's uh, Sam. I do stuff with cameras. Um, I have two Stay questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so my first question is, obviously Blade Runner is, you know, an epic in scale and a very big film. Um, I would like to know your thought process in capturing those types of scenes versus the first scene where um, uh, Ryan Gosling and Batista are like in such an intimate space. It's a very intimate scene. What was your thought process in that versus such a vast scale? And then the second question is um, in the scenes with uh, you know Jared Leto and you're in these brutalist uh, structures with rammed earth and uh, the water caustics and all of that. Um, for some of the scenes, you know, you'd be walking through a hallway 
and the shafts would go all the way through, you know, just for that specific shot. What's, but whenever you're, you know, wider, you know, there's a lot of light moving around. Was there a system in that, or was it just like, the shot looks cool, so, you know, we made it happen. I just thought the shot looked cool. <laughs> No, not really. No, I mean, my favourite, interesting, you mentioned the Sapper Morton's farm scene at the beginning. It's my favourite scene in the whole movie. And it's also, I think, about the last scene we shot yeah. in schedule. And um, just because it was always a cover set. And also remember going into it well before we shot it and looking at it, none of those windows were there. Yeah, there was a set, it was interesting. It was like a full wall set with a door and this yellow door because Denny wanted this sort of plastic yellow light coming in. And, uh, but there was no window, so I thought that that's not really going to work because he doesn't have any lighting inside, so we're not going to see a lot. It'll be easy to shoot, but it might look very good. And um, anyway, so we cut the set apart. No, we put some yeah. windows in. Um, what was I thinking? I mean, I the whole thing about I'm joking about the windows and that, but I was thinking of those silhouettes. I was thinking, yeah, I want something really dark, but dark doesn't look dark unless you've got light to contrast it with. So I wanted that kind of feeling of the, the, the silhouettes of the windows and this light only creeping into the space and then make a real point of the yellow at the door. Anyway, that was rambling on about that. How do I, how do I look any differently with a scene that's got a larger scope? I don't. I think that was, that I, I just, it's, it, it's about the characters, about the relationship of the characters within the scene, whether it's like, two guys fighting on top of a tower block in Skyfall or something. It's still about the relation of the characters and that. It's not, uh, you know, I mean, it's about putting them in the space. Uh, I don't I, can't, I don't think I'm approaching any different. I think one of the hardest scenes in this film was when Ryan comes back and he's kind of like debriefed or whatever. He's, he's in the white room. Well, we didn't know what to do with that. I mean, when I say we, Denny and Dennis and I, we're talking about, we've been through all the other sets, you know, when, when the android is birthed, that was a hard set, we came up with something. What are we going to do when he comes back and he's in the police station, he's getting downloaded or whatever it is? We just went, well, when you've got nothing, why not a white room? And Denny said, yeah, what if it's a really small white room with a funny little camera on the wall? And that was it, it was like... We were out of ideas, but that was the idea. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you know, it's, I, I'm just rambling, but you don't, I don't see any different approach, whether it's, you know, big or small. It's still about, you know, it's still about the character in some way and the character's relationship to that world. And, you know, yeah. a lot of times it's, it doesn't come just like that. You know, you, it goes round and round and round in your head. And, and Wallace's office, my God, I didn't think you'd ever get that. Because, you know, trying to figure it out, and is it a circle, is it a novel? And yeah, as I said earlier, you know, the, I started with the idea of, okay, if Wallace is building is kind of like sunlit or something, then, but the sun moves, so it's all got to move, which so I dug myself a hole really. And, and, and so I tried to bring that, there's a couple of scenes where it doesn't move, but uh, I tried to bring that into it just as a kind of like, somebody said, well, the film's not got noir elements, but to me that was a noir element, with this strangeness of this light just kind of moving. Okay, it's not shafts of hard light and all that stuff, but it has this kind of strange atmosphere, I think, because of the light moving, the, the shadows on the wall coming up, you know. All right, thank you. Was, so I'm going to ask you a question. I'm just doing it. Uh, <laughs> was there a parallel between scenes with that, where the light was moving a certain way and maybe another scene that was learned, uh, moving a certain way because of that, or was it just... Oh, I just, each set, I mean, had to 
do it, had to do it in a different way because each set needed to be lit differently. I mean, the, the one space that appears twice with different lighting, I just wanted to get the feeling of one being night and one being day, which it was outside. Obviously, it doesn't relate inside, but I thought, yeah, but he would have one for day and one for night, you know? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, who does stuff with cameras. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Marcus. Um, so this is more in response to No Country for Old Men. Um, there's, a, there's imagery that we experience in reality and the imagery that we experience through cinema. Uh, my question is, is there a metaphor or metaphysical, transcendental, a spiritual approach uh, to s discovering a project, um, or is it just a pragmatic approach? We get into spiritual things again. <laughs> um, um, no, I mean I, I do think I do think it's something that you discover. I don't think I don't just think of any director that's come in with a real hard look of a film that's not changed. No, I can't think of one. I think a director has an idea, has a direction to go in, and then. It's that collaboration that sort of, doesn't it? It, it, then it evolves into something and at some point, maybe you do have that moment that the light bulb goes off and yeah, that really works, that makes sense. And I think that's, yeah, that's one of the things we love about what we do. You know, you, you, have, you have those, yeah, you, you, you might, think of something for weeks and weeks and then wake up in the middle of the night and go, yeah, why don't we do this? And you know, wake up to the person uh, next to you. Yeah. Say, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, then, or, or then, or you might just, it might just happen on the set when you're looking through the lens, you know. Uh, yeah, that's, I don't know, the process these things happen. It's kind of, that's what's exciting about it, really. I, I, I don't think there's any... It's uh, exciting uh, but nerve-wracking, because, yeah. you know, I think, oh, before we actually have to do it, or we're going to have to figure it out. Right, it is true. Yeah, yeah. but then that, that that also uncertainty is kind of like also quite high, really. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Amazing team, y'all. Thank you. One person appreciated that comment about the amazing team. <laughs> Hey guys, so my name is Christian J. Uh, I used to be addicted to the soap, but I'm clean now. But uh, anyway, so earlier Katie came up here and she asked you guys like what was the most difficult uh, scene for you guys to film, and you brought up like the melding scene and kind of like went into how you shot that. And I'm just thinking, oh shit, you know that was kind of my question. So great, fantastic. But uh, so I'm kind of curious about like what kind of prep work goes into a scene where you've got like 20 different assets kind of going on all at once. You know, like uh, what what kind of departments you have to coordinate with the pull something off like that because uh, I mean just watching that scene every time my brain practically just melts seeing how you see one actress's face through the other and you see like one feature and it just kind of blends into some sort of vaguely recognizable human being like just something like that like how do you guys just go around even prepping something that seems so hard to even wrap your mind around just watching the final products well, I think, you know, that's that Denny's concept of these two characters melding. And then, you know, okay, how do you do it? But you, then you shoot, as I said, we shot a test, and, and the effects guys were kind of working on how the, that, that would, uh, how that would um, well, end up as a visual interpretation of what Denny was after. Well, also the whole character of Joy was a big discussion as to what she was. Would, would you see through her? Would she be able to pick something up? And that, for a lot of prep, we didn't know. And we That's kept true. trying different tests. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there's a danger with effects to go too far. Like, what happens to a hologram when the rain falls? Yeah. So it was all, they, they did all these tests and all this fancy looking stuff going on. But it was all distracting because actually you said to the audience, this hologram is a real person, and what does have a soul, maybe. You know, you wanted to, you, because Ryan K, you wanted him to believe this woman was something more than just a hologram or sex for money. And, and, and so there was a delicate balance there. So that's, that's why 
the transpa her transparency and everything else is quite minimal. It's enough to tell you if you look. So that, that, that also works really well with the blending scene because that, I mean, that is a scene where it actually tells you exactly what she is, you know. Um, but, but also, we shot it, we gave it to um, Paul at the, the visual effects house. And he put, he came up with a lot of that. I, I mean, I was surprised yeah. when he made the face, parts of the face were completely different, but they were right. parts of the, the, the right. girls. So he did a lot of work yeah. on that. Yeah, I mean, basically, I said, we, we shot it, I said to say, we shot it with the main character as a scene. Then we put the secondary character in and re-shot it again with that secondary character mimicking what the first take was, you know, you got playback and everything and you could really do it over and over, so mimic it as close as possible. And then it was about, up, it was up to effects and we should, we shot a play of the set with each camera angle. So that gave the effects team the way of, you know, rotoscoping one character out and blending them, you know. So they had, they had lots of, um, yeah, they had all the kind of flexibility in the world. It just took a lot of people a lot of time to do the road scoping. Well, hey, thank you very much for answering my question. Thank you. Hello. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Commissioner, for making this for us. My name is Demetria Glover. Uh, my question is, you kind of alluded to this already, but how often do you allow budget constraints to either hinder or influence your original vision? And if so, is there any one film that stands out? Is there only one left? Any film one film out. that stands out? Where budget constraints maybe affected what you wanted to do. Ah. With limitations comes inspiration. Great responsibility. We always Wrong call ourselves that. <laughs> I mean, the budget is a real thing. Um, the problem ha occurs when there is a certain budget you're trying to stick in with, but then the director wants something much bigger, and really the producer should be telling the director, calm down with the director saying to us, but I want this. So that's a problem because how do you make that happen? But budget is always a concern, yeah. so you think, do we, we put more of the budget on this scene and then find another way to do it much less expensively on this other little scene? Well, you talked about the Vegas sequence in this one. Um, maybe relay that story about what, what happened with the casino in Vegas with Elvis and the musicians on it. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it is. It's, I was going to mention that because it's all about finding a way to do it the best you can for the time and the money you've got. I mean, I think that happens on every film. It doesn't matter what scale it is. Uh, as I said once before, as soon as you pick up a camera, you're compromising. I mean, there's no way it's not a compromise in some way or the other. Um, there's the Vegas show with Elvis and all that. We're in a production meeting and it was like, oh, we spent all the money on these other sets and the effects on this is going to go over and the blending of the two girls is going to cost so much. So what are we going to do for Vegas? We haven't got a location. How are we going to shoot it? Uh, and I said, well, we've got any stage. We've got a free stage. And they said, oh, we've got one stage. I said, well, we just black it out. I'll just light it. Like, it's a show. Well, you don't have to see any background. Now, that might not have been exactly what the production designer wanted. Or Denny, really, at well, first instinct, they wanted this very glamorous, you know, Las Vegas, gold and red background, sort of wall and doors and all the rest of it. But we ended up with just black backing on the stage walls and it's all just done with lights and, you know, some modu modular furniture and a stage, you know, freestanding. So, you know, you, you, you make something work, work with what you've got uh, and, and the time you've got to shoot it. I mean, actually that, okay, we spent a lot of money getting um, a lighting company to program all the lighting. We had this whole stage of lighting that went for whatever the length of the scene was and it was all programmed out and um, and that took a lot because there's a lot of different variety in it 
variations of the lighting, but it was all programmed. We actually shot the scene in less time than it was scheduled for because we'd done all that prep, you know, even though we'd spent a lot of money on it, we saved a day shooting, you know. So, yeah, you, you just find a ways to make it work. And as James says, I, don't, I think if you didn't have restrictions, you wouldn't have something to, to react against, you know. If somebody came to the product, producer came to you, you have everything you want, go anywhere you want in the world, I'd be lost. I think any director would be lost, really. I think. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jesus. Um, uh, before I do my question, I just wanted to say that this is one of the few movies that actually made me into a cinephile today, and it motivated me to become a photographer, and it was a very significant moment of my life when I watched it, uh, back when I was like 12 years old when it came out, so thank you for that. Uh, my question is about something that you were talking about earlier, but I just want to elaborate a little more on that, which is, you were talking about how it's in a way important to not make the director feel like you're taking over his film. And as a cinematographer, you are also an artist um, yourself, and you want to make the films in which you work to feel like you are adding something and that in a way you are part of it and it's your work. So how do you uh, balance having a voice in your work and adding something that maybe nobody else could while also enhancing and respecting the vision of the director that you're working for? Hmm? Well, if you want it all to be your way, you should be a still photographer. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> I, 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 no, I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, I thought about directing a number of times over the years, but I actually love what I do, and I feel that I do make a contribution in some films that might not be as apparent in others, but I think I do contribute to the final look of something in any, every film I've worked on, there's something of me in it. And, and also, it's not just, you know, the cinematographer's job is not just making the image, it's actually running a crew. It's actually collaborating with maybe, you know, anything from five to 200 people. And it's, it's about that experience, and that's what you add to the film, the people that come with you, the whole, and it's also you're partly responsible to create the mood on the set and the space for the actors to do their work in. So, you know, I think, I mean, I'm not, you know, I feel, I feel every film that we've worked on, I've worked on before, I met James, has been a part of me in some way. Even the say whether it's noticeable or not, it doesn't really matter. I just, I would rather, I feel more comfortable, I feel more satisfied doing what I do as a cinematographer than that I think I would as if I was a director trying to do it, you know? Yeah, um, but my question was more about like, how do you like, do, uh, do the adding with, uh, without also like, you know, like, like how does that work in a way? How does that relationship work? I, I should um, Say it like that, I'm sorry. No, you just said it, it's a relationship, it's a collaboration. I mean, and, and sometimes it doesn't work and you don't really want to be there. Sometimes you don't have a relationship with a director. No, you don't, I mean, you're in the wrong place. It just doesn't, you just don't, you know, you know, just don't somehow get but off, I, blend. I, I think you can also be in a situation where um, the director might be a little insecure, and so you, on the side you say, "Well, maybe we should do it this way." No, 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 that's a that's a terrible idea. The director walks away, and 20 minutes later comes on the set and says, "I've had a great idea, <laughs> and this is what we're gonna, this can happen, and this is what we're going to do." So then, what you do is it's for the better of the film, and you just remember, and you know that you made the film better, even though no one else does. Well, you know, you made that contribution, yeah. and you're going to just smile to yourself. Oh, I, I heard that idea. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, it's fine. I mean, ideas can come from anybody, any direction. It's the final product of matters. And who cares where it came from? If you, I mean, <laughs> you just kind of feel, yeah, I'm part of that movie and No Country for Old Men and, and movies that I really think have something to say and are more like a film that led me to be part of the film industry in the first place. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, James. I'm Roger. Uh, my name is Andrew Red. Um, I want to thank both of you for your time and also the Dallas Book Commission and the Texas Theater for helping put this all together. Uh, <clears throat> my question for you is how do you approach pre production for a film like Blade Runner? And this is for Buffy, by the way, uh, for Blade Runner versus like Sicario or There Will Be Blood, any of the other films that aren't as visual effects heavy. Do you, do you change your approach, or, do you, uh, or is it kind of the same no matter what film you're going to, regardless of the effects? Yeah, exactly. you know, the first time we were with Danny, I, I don't know, I had three or four weeks of prep, I spent five, five, five weeks. But I mean, didn't have so much time talking with him going through the script. But we enjoyed the time we did have. And on Sicario, he made sure we had the time. We were in the production office. I remember he, we'd be in the production office. He'd lock the door so nobody would come in while we were discussing the script and starting to do storyboards and all the rest of it. And then, and then that just extended into Blade Runner. I don't know how much we had months and months and months. months, and months. Um, you know, and, and particularly two or three months prior to other people coming on board, where we just sort of explored it. Right, and then, then something like 1917, we had a lot more prep because we had to. Well, Roger and Sam sat down and discussed without the concept of a single shot. Where do, you, where do you want the camera to be? Do you want a two shot then? Do you want to be behind them, in front of them? And then we had to figure out how to shoot it. And then all of the departments needed to know where that shot started and ended. So that was a much longer prep, um, while some other movies. Yeah, I mean, so the process, it. in a way, is very, very similar every time. I mean, I would blame you. I mean, I don't remember us having a, a discussion about effects, not, not until the effects supervisors came on and we were actually well into prep, proper prep. Yeah. I mean, when, when, it was, when we were in Montreal, we weren't talking about effects. No, no, anything was We were talking about that, concepts yeah. and, and, and yeah. what should it be like, you know. Denny would call it the one chance you had to dream, and after that it's all compromised. But, but once we got to Budapest, we had a lot of meetings about Yeah, then you have endless meetings. But I mean, the actual start of it is trying to conceptualize something without feeling the restraints of budget, time, effects, complexity, or, you know, and everything else. Well, that's true. You, you sit around and you try and figure out what it is you want, if you could have anything. And that's the same thing with 1917. That's what you did. And then you figure out, oh, well, with this budget, how am I going to do it? What am I giving up? Um, and yeah, it's the same when I was mentoring a film I shot in 1983, which was a low-budget film in Scotland. It was the same process. What do you want? Let's look at the locations. How can we make this work? That doesn't work. What do we need? You just break it down. It's the same approach, really. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Yeah, you're basically saying if it's a $100 million film or if it's a $5 million film, you still have to give things up no matter what it is. It depends on what you're giving up. Yeah. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Breck, and um, a lot of the films that we mentioned, including the one we watched today, have a lot of core elements to me. Um, a lot of Blade Runner, Sicario, Prisoners have a lot of these kind of horrific themes to them, even if they're not necessarily considered a horror film. Um, and I was wondering, from the both of you, if you had any particular favorite horror movies themselves, and have they ever inspired you at all in your own work? Horror movies. Um, I think uh, I think I was always. I think when I first saw Hour of the Wolf, uh, Bergman, 
comes out, the wolf kind of blew me away. I haven't seen it for years, I better watch it again. And um, Mernon's Nosferatu, I think, gave me nightmares. I mean, I, I do love horror movies. I'd like to shoot a real horror movie. Yeah. I'd love to see, love to see that. <laughs> Were you, were you ever a fan of the Universal Horror films, you know, growing up? The old Frankenstein, Wolfman, I love 1941 Wolfman, one of my favorites. I'm so mad about those, but um, <laughs> yes. I, I used to like the Eastern European things, really weird. There's some great Russian movies that are like horror movies. There's a, a war film um, called a Letter from a Dead Man, I think it's called. Uh, by an Alex son and Jermaine, which is pretty wonderful and horrific. It's a great movie. Um, well, I guess it's strictly not a horror film, it's just a... Yeah. Yeah. Great. Is anybody keeping a list of all these films so that later we can post it online and say Roger's recommended film for this weekend? <laughs> Hour of the Wolf, Letter, what was that one? Letter Russian? I think it's Letter from a Dead Man. Letter from a Dead Man. You can find it on a, a website. Uh, Soviet, Soviet and Russian cinema. No, Soviet um, movies online. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like Britbox? Uh, Soviet movies online? It's five dollars a day. You can watch anything you want. It's got all Tarkovsky. It's got everybody's film, every Russian and Soviet film ever made. It's really great. During lockdown, <laughs> then, I was going through it and finding these wonderful movies. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, thank you all for being up on stage, and uh, thanks to the Dallas Film Commission. Uh, I am, my name is Jack, I am currently in film school, working as a freelance cinematographer. Uh, and my question is, uh, when you're working with a new director, what is something that makes them really stand out to you? Well, if they have a, a vision right away, that's a good thing. That's uh, just passion, really. Passion. I mean, you know, I will, we work with directors that we've worked with for quite a few, the last years. Um, I think the last time well, um, John Crowley we worked with once on, on, on Goldfish, so I haven't worked with before, obviously. Um, but it's passion, yeah. It's a passionate man. I mean, actually, all the directors we work with are pretty passionate, aren't they? Passionate and being collaborative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, really, I don't know what stands out other than that. I don't know. I mean, I've worked with the director that has said, I know nothing about the camera or setting shots. I want you to do that, and I'll just, uh, I'm just going to deal with the script and the, and the actors. And I've, you know, obviously worked with Joel and Ethan a long time. And they know so much about all aspects of it, you know. Um, so it's, I don't want any specific thing from a director other than that just feel that I'm going to get on with them and, and feel their passion for what they're going to do. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. I think that's really interesting to hear you say is that, you know, it doesn't matter if the director doesn't know anything about the camera, as long as that they're passionate, they have strong vision, and you feel like you can work well together, that's what's most important. They don't need to know the lens choice or, you know, you know whatever, you know, depth of field you're shooting at or anything like that. But the worst thing is when you're working really, really hard and you don't, and you think the director doesn't want to do anything, you know, it is like, well, doesn't want to do a rehearsal afterwards when we desperately need a rehearsal to figure out what the hell we're shooting the next day. That is, that's the worst. You want a person that, like you, wants to make the best movie that can be made with this very low budget. Great. Awesome. Um, thanks, guys. Um, my name is Spencer, uh, James and Roger. Thank you so much for being here taking the time to answer all of our questions. Um, simply, uh, Blade Runner is kind of takes a departure with colored lights and stuff like that from kind of your previous stuff. And I just wanted to ask, um, and James, you can answer this too. Um, do you have a favorite color? <laughs> and the black. Vice <laughs> versa, a color that you're like, I don't want to, I just hate it. Or like, oh god, they're making me shoot it. Green screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
green in that context. Yeah. I'm not that fond of orange. It can be kind of harsh sometimes. But I like colors when they're put together. Thank you. That's it. Favorite yeah. color? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hey there, James and Roger. Uh, thanks for coming. This has been fantastic. Uh, my name is Michael. I uh, want to ask a little bit about social media, actually. Um, well, then uh, Roger's not answering. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually a question for both of you, so that's great. Um, he doesn't know anything about it, that's what. Uh, I read a lot about uh, authors, journalists, film critics bemoaning the, um, the effects that social media have on attention spans of, of audiences, as they, as they uh, younger audiences in particular. And, um, you know, I, I find that to be a travesty, if, if true, because we have this beautiful film right here that's, that's about three hours long. And when I talk to my younger cousins and family members, when they think three hours, my God, they'd rather be doom scrolling on Instagram or TikTok with that kind of time. But I remember reading, uh, it was a Playboy article with Stanley Kubrick, and he was talking about how he used to ship tapes of the Super Bowl to England where he would live and it was because he, he didn't like the football, he liked the commercials. He used to say that the commercials refined the storytelling in a point where there was no fat in the, in the story. It was, it was the essential story within 30 seconds. So uh, do either of you, um, both of you, have an opinion on the effects of social media as it relates to the attention spans of, of okay. young people? So Stanley Kubrick liked 60 minute or 90 minute commercials or whatever, 30 second, I mean second commercials. That's right, yeah. yeah. And yet 2001 has got some of the most <laughs> longest hell <laughs> I've got. Oh, Barry Lyndon. Yeah. Oh, I mean, my favorite film, Doctor Strange, like one of my favorite, all time favorite films. I mean, it doesn't look like a commercial at all. And yeah, I mean, some, okay, but I'm not getting personal about this, but some films that are two and a half or three hours long feel, feel like they're eight hours long. And they feel so boring. But others feel like they're only 90 minutes long. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know what I'm saying. Really. <laughs> I, you know, but I think you're right that there is sort of a lack of an attention span because nowadays if you try and take a movie and build slowly to something as you could have in the past, um, a lot of people will reject it and won't like it because they just want to know, know, like a Marvel film, this happens and this happens, then this happens, and yeah. that's what they're comfortable with. So yeah, I don't I think, think there's a change. Yeah, I think there's a difference between filmmaking and narrative storytelling. Mm -hmm. See, I think filmmaking is, whatever it is, Doctor Strange Love, or it's Tarkovsky's movies, or it's Kurosawa, or oh, it's Alan Rene, I mean, I could go on. That's filmmaking. But most of what we're seeing now, which has been, I think, driven by the, you know, by people's attention span and by commercials and commercialism, is just kind of narrative storytelling. And then you want what it ends up being is a lot of talking heads. I don't think that's filmmaking. I, you know, I think, I think there's a whole world of filmmaking. It's kind of wonderful and wondrous, yeah. but we haven't scratched the surface yet, and I don't see many people still scratching. <laughs> yeah, so I, I tend to agree with you. Is there anything from short form that you think has positively affected cinema? Well, short films are great because it's like a short story. You have to tell that story. It's a discipline in a way. Okay, thank James, you. James and I were just talking about how uh, uh, Roger started his new TikTok account coming soon. <laughs> Good luck for to Keep an eye out for that. Thank you. A lot of selfies with Roger on TikTok, dancing videos and more coming soon. Uh, speaking of short, short films, uh, we'll give a quick plug to the Oak, uh, Oak Cliff Film Festival coming up uh, next weekend here, where you get to see some excellent short films here at the Texas Theater Film Festival as well. Hello, my name is Chris. Um, I want to preface this. This is a three-parter, so please forgive me. Every single film room in here wants to know this. 
What is your letter box? <laughs> Letterbox? No? Okay. It's, it's an app. It's, a, it's, a, it's an app on the phone. Very important. So, <laughs> uh, real question here. What is something that you see in young filmmakers that you want to see more of? And what is something you see in young filmmakers that you want to see less of? Oh, no. I, I mean, I just copy it for me. I mean, I, I you know. We see a lot of students work and we sometimes judge films, you know, on my watch students films from around the world and it's just really inspiring to see where people are and what they're trying to do. We, we watched somebody's film yesterday that somebody had given us the day before and it was a wonderful 30 minute shoot. Short film, you know, that I, I thought was just stunning. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of inspirational work out there. I just hope somebody takes them, those people, in hand. As it's, you, need the, you need the creative producers and that to allow them to go to a larger format. So, in response to the question, though, I think that um, the, what we love is the passion, when we see the passion and the creativity. What we don't like is when we see them trying to create something with flash, you know, just using a lot of flashy stuff as opposed to remembering what the story was. Thank you. Thank you. And it was a big no on your letterbox question. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? My name is Philip. Uh, uh, thank you for coming. A little closer to the microphone. You got it. Thank you for coming. The movie was awesome. The second time I've seen it, it gets better every time. I watch it five more times. Um, Mike, I have two questions. The short one is kind of simple, um, but I really got to ask it. What do you do to practice cinematography outside of the set? Or do you practice cinematography outside of the set? Is that photography itself, film photography? Do you do anything to like practice it? Because I'm an aspiring cinematographer. And I'm always itching to practice it. You know, I can't always get on set to practice it, but I'm always looking for that way to itch, you know, scratch that itch. And then my, uh, my answer that one first. <laughs> I don't, I, don't, I don't really do anything deliberately practice, no. I mean, I've also thought about it, I've never done it, but I mean, like, you know, today we went to the museum here, you know, looked at a lot of paintings and various things. I mean, yeah, I, I, I take stills, but I don't see that really that related to what I do in film. But, um, but I watch a lot of films, and we watch an enormous amount of films. And, and that. But in terms of practice, like taking a camera out on lights and then practice, I don't know what to practice without a story to practice on. <laughs> and I don't write. <laughs> yeah, then the last one, real quick, uh, is um, where did you take your leap of faith into the industry? Uh, so my dad told me, it's like, you work a lot and try to get in the industry, but there's going to be a point where you take that leap of faith go, okay, I'm not going to be doing a 9 to 5 on the side, I'm going to be doing filmmaking for the rest of my life. Where was that moment in your life? Did you take that leap of faith and like, okay, I'm not going to do anything else, I'm just going to do this, even if it, I go bust and it all blows up from here, I'm going to take that leap of faith? I did, this, I did the sort of art college film school route. Um, I think my leap of faith was leaving home to go to art college, really. And say you know, I don't, I don't want to do what my dad did with his life. You know, um, you know, I didn't want the profession that he did. He was a builder. I mean, I used to work on building sites and stuff with him, but I, I didn't want that as my life. And uh, so I think just taking that jump and going away from home to our college, but that's not really any kind of light bulb moment. It was a slow transition from that to finding myself on a film set with. Know, some great actors, and I'm suddenly thinking, oh, this is me, you know? Thank you. Of course, you did quit the business a couple of times, and then you left back into it. Only three. <laughs> <laughs> Only, when was the last time you quit the business? That was a while ago. Pre, pre couple of statues? We <laughs> don't do that. Hello, my name is Xiaohan. 
Uh, my question is, what is the way you like most, how you think is most efficient that directors talk their visions with cinematographers? Do you think storyboard is absolutely necessary? Think what is this? Do you think storyboard? storyboard? No, 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 definitely not at all. No. Um, I, d I don't think really I did work with many people who storyboarded until working with Joel and Ethan Cohen. Um, the first time I did with Sam Mendes, we didn't storyboard at all. No, I don't think storyboard is necessary. I think some discussion, some prep, uh, some some. Well, going through the script together. Yeah, you're going through the script and kind of envisioning it. But I mean, just kind of like. But it doesn't have to even, it's weird, because it doesn't even have to be like being at all specific about what shots are or anything. It's just the sort of feel of the film. I mean, I think you've just got to get on the same page, director and his crew, as, as to what you're trying to achieve. Just, uh, you know, yeah, uh, I think, I think. I think uh, images have emotional resonance, resonance, obviously, so I think you can talk on an emotional level about a script and that impacts the way everybody's going to work on it and what they come up with. You know, so I, I don't think there's any one way of doing it. I mean, I, I say on, on Jive with Sam, we didn't really do anything. We discussed the sets and what spaces we needed. And then we put the actors in there, they had let the actors do what they wanted to do, and I just shot it handheld. I mean, that's how we started. And then we just developed the scene with the camera. Um, so there's not any one right way of doing it. I don't think. So you, you, you do need scoreboard, you do need uh, like a mood board or pictures. The thing the most important thing is you, you and the director can understand the script the same way, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, uh, yeah, that mood boards helps, you know, usually a production designer will do a whole set of mood boards. I don't, I don't think that's totally necessary. Um, you, can, you can discuss imagery by, you know, each, each bring in sort of a photographer's work that you like or something, just as a starting point. You might talk about other movies, but I found that's, that's a real rarity, talking about other movies. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you both for your time. I have two quick questions for both of you. Uh, the first would be, is there a piece of literature that um, in particular you, either of you feel like would be interesting for you to adapt into a film to work on? Like if a director came to you with that book in particular, you would jump at that opportunity. And then my second question is a bit selfish, but I'm just curious if either of you have a favorite Wong Kar Wai movie. Favorite, what was it? Uh, Wong Kar Wai movie. Oh. You stomped them. Books. Um, you know, I, I love reading books. Um, no, there's so many. I mean, a, yeah, I mean, I couldn't, I don't know where to start. Um, no, I don't know where to start, sorry. Uh, one car wide movie, I suppose. You've got to say in the mood for love, haven't you? But I don't like, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I guess. Let's go! <laughs> yeah, but I mean, books, I, I don't know, there's so many books. I would love for. Uh, the last, the last book I read was John Sayles, a film director, but also as a writer, he's got a book. Coming, it came out just a few months ago about um, uh, two characters at the, after the Battle of Culloden, you know, and um, the birth of the American nation, really. It sounds a big topic, it is. I don't know how you make a film like that, it'd be a very long one, but it would make a wonderful film. It's another three hour movie. Oh, there it is, we're here. 12 hour movie. 12, yeah. yeah. Thank you both. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Maximo, and uh, for Blade Runner, um, I noticed a lot of moving lights, uh, shafts of light coming in. Do you remember anything specific about the lighting rig that you use? Uh, what lights did you use? Sorry, I'm not an electrician in Gaffer, so just curious about the technical aspect of, uh, of that. And 
and how, when you do rigs, do you yourself design them, or do you work a lot with the gaffer? I'm sure you do a gaffer and key grip, or you're like, I want this light to do this, you figure it out. Um, we, we do light in diagrams. I mean, I talk, I'm that guy in, in, in this film, I talked at length with Billy O'Leary, who's a gaffer I work with since Sid and Nancy days, on and off. Uh, he was with us in, in Budapest, but uh, yeah, I'm very specific about the kind of unit I want. Maybe not necessarily if it's a 2K for an L or a 5K for an L, because I usually under understand. <laughs> um, but you know, the moving lights, some were moving, some were done like a chase. The, the scene where you first meet Jared Leto was three circles each had sort of, I don't know if it was like 20, 20 odd T12s on a chase. The last night scene where Harrison Ford meets um, uh, Rachel. Rachel again, yeah. Um, there was 300 betweenies on a big circle, a 30 foot circle of um, pipe. Um, so you prefer tungsten over LEDs? Well, I did in this case, yeah, because I wanted the, I wanted the way they died uh, and the light like, come on. I wanted the way it would get warm as if the lamp dies. I wanted to want the softness of the edge. I wanted, there wasn't a really good LED for, for an L at that time. You couldn't have done the color shift without a huge amount of programming and they would have been about 40 times as expensive as getting you might have 300 between these, there's a lot of little lamps, but they were really cheap because nobody really wanted to use them anymore. And the T12s as well, it wasn't a huge expense in fact, because again, we, we had uh, some sort of deal with the lighting company, so. Um, and what else did we, yeah, Billy found that there was um, barbers on the place in New York lighting, supplier in New York had 24K, bolts for sky pans. So we took the 24K bolts and put them on a little pulley rig and had them go up and down or had them chase along the ceiling. When they walked down the corridor between the uh, replicant statues, that's these bare bulbs just on a trolley rig that Billy Rick uh, figured out. And he literally pulled the bolt by hand across the set to give the shafts a light boot. So, yeah, I mean, there's lots of different ways of doing things, and um, I guess I had too much free time. I came up with the right time. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great. Our first real technical question there, so that was fun. Hi, Roger and James. Uh, do you guys have any like essentials that you take to set to make your days more comfortable, since they are very long? <laughs> tea, lots of tea. <laughs> well, that's right. Decaf coffee? Yeah, right. Early decaf for okay. Roger. Any specific shoes you wear to make your, your you know, standing on your, uh, yeah. 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 We're in Texas, he's got some boots on here, so. Actually, I got these in Georgia. They're like Georgia farm boots, but they're made in New Jersey. <laughs> I'm Laura. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Texas Theater, also the Dallas Film Commission, for this wonderful opportunity. And thank you guys for being on stage and talking to us and answering all of our questions. Um, but I wanted you to say that my husband and I are actors, but in between a slump, we will produce short films, whatever we can. Um, so it's just very inspiring to see a husband and wife on stage, working together, you know, doing this stuff. Um, so thank you so much for you know, being here. Um, my question is, you know, we've got just this tour alone, I mean, 1917, 2049, um, Sicario, Skyfall, like a myriad of things. Um, the, the, the main character story is, is much the same where they're striving for something, but overall the story is it, it's different, it's a different time, it's a different genre, it's a different whatever. What, what is your first step when you get the script or when the director comes to you or whatever? What, what, do you, what is your first step in preparing for a film? You know, whether it be 1917, whether it be Sicario, what, what excites you, what, what begins that journey for you guys? 
Well, we read the script first and see whether it appeals to us. Mm -hmm. And if, if we like it and it moves us, then we talk to the director before taking a job to make sure that we're all on the same page because maybe they want to do something completely different. And yeah, then, it's really about the, it's really just, I, I mean, yeah, just building that relationship with the director before, before he even, I mean, obviously, I mean, you read anything, you read a script, you read a novel, you visualize it in your head, but you try not to kind of like settle on anything until you've had a discussion with the director because the director can have a different interpretation. Right. And it might be one that, you know, excites you, but it might not, it might be one that doesn't excite you. I mean, I went for an interview once with a director and the first thing they said, is, I want this to look like Shawshank Redemption. I mean, I couldn't have been out the door more quick. <laughs> I mean, you know, because every film should find its own visual kind of space, really, I think. Anyway. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name's Ricky. Thank you so much for asking, uh, answering all these questions. Um, my question about the future. Um, you're, you've achieved so much, uh, the impact on cinema, the book, book you just published, and the way you guys engage with fans of your work. And I just wanted to know, are there other mountains you want to climb or adventures you both want to go on collaboratively that you haven't yet, whether it be professional or personal? Everest would be good, actually, but no. <laughs> Well, we're doing the podcast has really sort of taken off. It, it, it's something we started just before the pandemic, and it just sort of has taken off in a way that neither of us expected, really. And we actually have two other things, but we're in the midst of trying to figure out whether it's going to work or not, so we can't really talk about it. So Yeah, so it's kept us really busy. And there's no project, film projects at the moment. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, we do hope... We'll be offered something and we'll be out there again. But pretty sure, pretty sure that'll happen. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, but I say, it's, 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 the, the podcast is really interesting, I think. You know, and um, yeah, it, it, we get satisfaction from it because we feel we are contributing and when so many of you come up and say we love the podcast I mean it's like, I mean it really does actually have a big effect I mean that's kind of nice so I mean, you know whatever you do, you're trying to have, I don't know, enrich people's lives or some pretentious statement like that but you are trying to, trying to give something and to get that sort of feedback it's like Okay, maybe we'll keep doing the podcast for a while. Please do. It definitely enriched a lot of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're coming up on the last questions here. This better be good. Hi. Uh, from an artistic and a storytelling perspective, uh, if my memory serves me, Denise Villeneuve and the Coen Brothers. Uh, Can you go a little closer to the microphone? Yeah. Uh, from an artistic and storytelling perspective, Denise. Uh, Villeneuve and the Coen Brothers, if my memory serves me, uh, have pretty restrained romantic scenes. And I was just wondering, I think I prefer it, and I was just wondering if you could help me make something that's not published. Uh, what went uh, into those decisions from the director? Restrained you know, romantic scenes, yeah. But they don't have sex scenes. <laughs> well, I, I would say, you know, the one that, like, you watch something like Euphoria, and they're kind of like taking it to, to the nth degree on steroids. So I, I think I prefer it this way. I was just wondering if you could help me understand what, what goes into those decisions. Wait, it's like, it's like they don't also have, uh, you know, unnecessary action scenes. They don't, or they don't have, they don't have flashy lighting. They don't have ostentatious camera moves that are just there for themselves. I mean, if it's not part of the, the story and that to sort of serve a purpose, you know. I mean, I, there's sometimes you think, well, some of the Coen brothers' violence is really very, very vivid, but then you look at Quentin Tarantino's work and think, that was pretty mute, really. <laughs> but the thing about their violence, it, when it is really vicious, it's done so quickly, it's almost over in the big blink of an eye and it feels so real. Um, 
that it doesn't feel gratuitous in my head anyway. Because sometimes I do kind of worry about violence in films. I don't like it at all. But I think mean, sometimes it does make a point. And, uh, but generally, I mean, generally sex, sex scenes are there to sell a film, aren't they? They're not really, I don't know. I mean, most of them I find quite there for com commercial reasons and not much else. I, mean, I don't know if they think like that. I've never talked to either the Kyle's or Denny about that in particular. I mean, I certainly, I mean, Denny's not prudish about any of that at all. Actually, some of his films have, have quite, I wouldn't say explicit sex, but like the, one of the first films I shot, I'm sorry, 1984, um, there's a scene in where, where the main two characters, a man and a woman, are sort of naked in a room and wandering around. But you don't think about it. You know, it's, so it's all context, isn't it, really? But there's also um, the fact that when you, the studio and um, the director agree to do a film, oftentimes there's a discussion about what the rating's gonna be. And so that actually comes into um, play in that it's a lot easier to get the reading that they want if they don't do heavy sex scenes. So. Yeah, and there's also the, there's also the conversation about how many action scenes you have to have in your movie. You know, I mean, it does happen, you know. Well, that's because there actually is a person in the studio that says, okay, so you have Benicio, this is a Sicario, uh, del Toro in this film, so that's a three. Then you have this car chase, so that's whatever points. And they add the points together and then say, okay, so this many points, then this is what the budget has to be. Well, you need a couple more, couple more car chases, we'll give you a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> it is a business. Yeah, right. It is a business. They keep All telling right. us. Thank you very much. Tanner, I'm assuming you don't have a question since you've been driving around with all week, so. Oh, now you do have a question. All right. This is the last question. So no, pr no pressure. Tanner. No pressure. All right, thank you guys. Uh, first, thank you for sharing your first time here in Dallas. It's really an honor to uh, be with you guys and to um, ask you this final question for the night. Um, so my question is, uh, what would you say is the big difference between shooting a uh, film in Europe or with a European crew or a crew in the UK versus a crew in uh, America? Because I know that, um, and through this documentary I watched uh, called Alien, uh, and it's uh, talking about James Cameron, he was frustrated about how the crew needed to take, uh, I think it was like this, like they had to take lunch or tea time at a certain time of day. And um, is that something you experienced, or is that something you experienced um, while you're filming in um, Europe versus? Actually, America? nowadays in Europe, they have what they call, sorry, this is my pet peeve, a 10 hour continuous day, and we never do anything under 14 or something. And so they don't let you stop for lunch because they say, but you'll get off in 10 hours, which isn't true um, ever. So that, but that's more recent in your I don't think it's much difference. I mean, it, 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 but the, the so thing you is, you don't get lunch. Either side of the Atlantic, it's about the crew you have with you. You know, it's about the, the team that you choose. I, I think, and, and, and they the way they want to work. I mean, I, I, I remember doing a film in about 1986. And I remember working 90 odd hours in a week. And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, it's like, yeah, you could do that here. I remember on a, on a big production here, doing a 23 hour day. I remember we did 11 hours without a break. And I complained to the producer. And well, I actually never work with him again, but that's all right. <laughs> no, I think it's but, whoever you work with, and it's not, yeah. But then there's also the difference in the systems, the grip and all yeah. the Yeah, there's a different system. I mean, the um, grip and electric over here, but it's not like that. You, you know, the, 
the electricians in Europe deal with diffusions and bounce materials and all those sort of things. And it's just a slightly different system. But, um, so sometimes when you're mixing crews, it becomes a little difficult because the, whose system are you going to go yeah, with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever had an opportunity to work on, you know, like the, you know, Clint Eastwood, infamous, famous, whatever we want to use for, you know, having like the eight-hour day, you know, kind of thing, like eight or nine hours, supposedly, that I've heard. I don't know if it's actually true or not, but everybody says he does it eight hours, you know, nine to five, and he's done, and they're done for the day. Well, I work with, we work with um, um, Norman Jewison a couple of times, once on a TV movie and once on Hurricane with Denzel Washington. And yeah, I don't remember us going over. We broke for lunch. I don't remember us going over 10 or 11 hours. That's the, the old days, though. I remember working on something and um, we were like in our 23rd hour, and I was asking the producer, why can't you just add some extra days? Because we are so under schedule. He said, because I can hide the overtime, I can't hide an extra day. Oh, we did another story. I was on a okay. Let's on a rock stories. video. <laughs> I was on a you know, music video once. It was great. We um, crew was falling apart after like 20 hours. Producer came on set with a suitcase full of money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, we'll go on. We were, I don't know how long we worked, but it was like a good old 30 odd hour. I think it was something. I don't know. All right, well, hey, it has been an amazing, how many days have you guys been in town now? You got to town Wednesday, 17. right? Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we, we've had you here for a long time. We, uh, I think I can speak for myself and Andrew and Texas Theater and everyone here that we appreciate you not just being here this evening, but for all week that you've been here and all the things that you've done with, you know, talking to the students at SMU and women in film and the podcast that you've done uh, with us and, and this evening. It's all been amazing and we're very, very grateful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.